So this is the first installment of Reading from Pilgrim's Progress. You may have read this book before. You may have read it several times before. You may be very familiar with this book. You may have never read it before. Well, I've enjoyed reconnecting with this story, and so what I want to do is I want to read one stage each week. So today, I'm just going to give you a little introduction, tell you a little bit about what Pilgrim's Progress is about, a little bit about the author, John Bunyan, and then read the first stage. There are 10 stages in part one, and then there is a conclusion. So each week, I'll read one stage. You can listen to it at, its, at your leisure, okay? So, often disguised as something that would help him, evil accompanies Christian on his journey to the celestial city. As you walk with him, you'll begin to identify today's many religious pitfalls. These are, these are presented by men such as Pliable, who turns back at the slew of despond, and Ignorance, who believes he's a true follower of Christ when he's really only trusting in himself. Each character represented in this allegory is intentionally and profoundly accurate in its depiction of what we see all around us, and unfortunately, what we too often see in ourselves. But while Christian is injured and nearly killed, he eventually prevails to the end. So can you. Now to the author, here's a little bit about John Bunyan. John Bunyan was born in November of 1628 in Elstow, England. A celebrated English minister and preacher, he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress in 1678, the book that was the most characteristic expression of the Puritan religious outlook. His other works include doctrinal and controversial writings, a spiritual autobiography, Grace Abounding, which was written in 1666, and the allegory, The Holy War, which was written in 1682. So now we'll go to the uh, first stage, part one, stage one, Pilgrim's Progress. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I came upon a certain place with a den, and I lay down to sleep. I fell asleep and dreamed. In my dream, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place, with his face turned from his own house. In his hand, he held a book, and he bore a great burden upon his back. He opened the book, and as he read, he wept and trembled. Unable to contain his emotions any longer, he broke out with a mournful cry, What shall I do? In the midst of this dilemma, he returned home, but he restrained himself as he pondered his true feelings. At first, even his wife and children were unaware of his distress, but he grew more and more troubled. Finally, his wife asked, What's the matter? He could no longer stay silent. He told his wife and children what he had learned from the book and how it troubled his mind. Dear, he said to his wife, and you, my children, I love you dearly. He looked from one to another. A burden lies heavily upon me. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. You see, I've learned that our city will be burned from fire with fire from heaven. I'm afraid we are all doomed. Even you, my sweet children, unless I can find some way of escape, but I haven't found any way. His wife and children didn't believe a word of what he said to be true and looked at him as if he'd lost his mind. They hoped a good night's sleep would settle his frenzied thoughts. With this hope in mind, his family hurried him off to bed, but his mind remained just as troubled in the night as it was during the day. He tossed and turned with tears and sighs until the sky brightened with the dawn. His family looked at him with concern. They could see he hadn't slept. It's worse and worse. He started to talk to them again about what he learned in the book. At first they tried to console him, but as he went on, their faces hardened with anger. Finally, they had had enough and answered him gruffly with harsh words. Sometimes they even ridiculed him, and other times they scolded him. Finally, they just ignored him. It saddened him to see them like this, 
In fact, he pitied them. He'd often go to his bedroom to pray for them as a way to soothe his misery, or he'd walk alone through fields while reading or praying. One day he walked in the fields while reading his book, and he became so distressed that he burst out crying. What shall I do to be saved? He looked this way and that as if he would run, but instead he stood still. He didn't know which way to go. As he stood there, a man named Evangelist walked up to him and asked, Why are you crying? He answered, Sir, I've read in this book I'm holding that I am condemned to die, and after that comes judgment, and I find that I'm not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Then Evangelist said, Why aren't you willing to die, since this life is riddled with so many evils? The man answered, because I fear that this burden upon my back will sink me lower than the grave, and I shall fall into Tophet, or Gehenna. And sir, the man said, if I'm not fit to go to prison, then I'm not fit to go from judgment to execution. Distress wrinkled his brow. The thoughts of these things make me cry. Evangelist studied the man. If this is your condition, why are you standing here still? The man shrugged, because I don't know where to go. Evangelist handed him a parchment roll, and on it were the words, Flee from the wrath to come. The man read it and looked carefully at Evangelist. Where must I flee to? Evangelist pointed his finger over a very wide field. Do you see the wicked gate over there in the distance? The man squinted. No. Evangelist asked, Do you see the shining light in the distance? I think I do. Evangelist said, Keep that light in your eye and go up directly to it. If you do, you will see the gate. Upon arrival at the gate, when you knock, you will be told what you should do. In my dream, the man began to run. He hadn't run far from his own door when his wife and children noticed what he was doing and cried out to him, Come back! Come home! The man put his fingers in his ears and ran on. Life! Life! Eternal life! He didn't turn to look at his home or family behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. His neighbors also came out to see him run. The man continued to run even though some of his neighbors mocked him. Others threatened him, and some joined with his family and cried for him to return. Among those neighbors calling for him to come home, two decided to grab him and forcibly drag him back. The name of the one was obstinate, and the name of the other, pliable. The man had run a good distance ahead of them, but they were determined to pursue him. They chased after him, and a short time later, they overtook him. Neighbors, why have you come after me? The man asked as he caught his breath. We have come after you to persuade you to go, to go back with us. The man shook his head. I can no longer live in the city of destruction. I know I was born there and have lived my whole life there, but I've seen the truth of living and dying there. Sooner or later, you will sink lower than the grave, into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Don't go back. Come with me, the man pleaded with his neighbors. What? Obstinate looked at him, eyes wide with surprise, and leave our friends and our comforts behind? Yes, Christian said, for that was the man's name. All you leave behind isn't worthy to be compared with the tiniest portion of that which I am seeking to enjoy. If you come with me, you'll hold it yourself and fare as well as me, because where I go, there is more than enough. Come with me, and you'll see that I'm speaking the truth. Obstinate's brows knit into furrows of confusion. What are the things you seek, since you leave all the world to find them? I seek an incorruptible inheritance, Christian answered. It's pure and untarnished, and it never fades and it is laid up in heaven where it is safe, to be given at the appointed time to those who diligently seek it. 
He extended the book toward obstinate. Read it, if you will, in my book. Tush! Obstinate held up his hand and with a flick of his wrist said, Away with your book. Will you go back with us or not? Christian shook his head. No, I will not. I have laid my hand to the plow and will not look back. Obstinate motioned with a sweeping gesture toward his neighbor, Pliable, to join him. Come, Pliable, let's turn around and go home without him. He shrugged. There's a company of these crazy-headed, vain, and conceited men who think they are wiser in their own eyes than seven men. Pliable didn't move. He said, don't berate him. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he seeks are far better than the things that hold our attention. I'm inclined to go with him. Obstinate threw his, threw his arms in the air. What? Another fool? Listen to me and go back. Who knows where such a brain-sick fellow will lead you? Go back. Go back, he pleaded. It's the wise thing to do. No, Christian said to Obstinate. Come with your neighbor pliable. The things I spoke of are real, plus there are many more glories, too. If you don't believe me, read this book. He extended the book toward Pliable this time. You'll find truth in what it says, and it's all confirmed by the blood of him who made it. Pliable looked from Christian to Obstinate. <clears throat> well, Obstinate, I think I'll go along with this good man and cast my lot with him. He turned his attention to Christian. My good companion, do you know the way to this desired place? I've been directed by a man whose name is Evangelist to hurry to a little gate where we shall receive instructions about the way. Pliable found that to be agreeable. Come then, good neighbor, let's be going. The two of them headed off together while Obstinate stood in his place. I'm going back home, he called after them. I will not be the companion of such misled, weird fellows. In my dream, when Obstinate had gone back, Christian and Pliable walked along the plain of ease, and Christian talked with his traveling companion. So how do you feel, Pliable, he asked. I am so glad you were convinced to come along with me. If Obstinate had felt what I have felt of powers and terrors, of what is yet unseen, then I'm sure he would not have turned his back on us as he did. Pliable hungered to know more. Since it is just the two of us, Christian, tell me more. What are the things you spoke of and how are they to be enjoyed? Where are we going? Christian struggled to put his thoughts into words. It's easier to comprehend them with my mind to explain them verbally. But since you're asking... I will read of them in my book. Pliable pointed at the book. So you think the words of your book are absolutely true? Christian nodded without any doubt. Yes, of course. It was made by him who cannot lie. Very well. Try to tell me of these things. What are they? Christian motioned with his hand as he explained. There is an endless kingdom to be inhabited, an everlasting life to be given us, in order that we may live in that kingdom forever. Brilliant! And what else? Well, there are crowns of glory to be given us and garments that will make us shine like the sun in the skies of heaven. That is very pleasant news. What else? There shall be no more crying nor sorrow, for he who owns the place will wipe all tears from our eyes. And who will be there with us? Pliable wondered out loud. There will be seraphim and cherubim, creatures that will dazzle your eyes. You'll also meet with thousands and ten thousands who have gone before us to that place. Everyone there will be loving and holy, with everyone walking about in the sight of God and standing in his presence with everlasting acceptance. In a word, there we shall see the elders with their golden crowns and the holy virgins with their golden harps. And we'll see men who were cut into pieces by the world, burnt in flames, eaten of beasts, drowned in the seas, all because of their love for the Lord of the place. 
all will be well and clothed with immortality as with a garment. Just hearing all of this is enough to overwhelm me. But are these things to be enjoyed? And how is it we get to share in all of this? The Lord, the governor of the country, has recorded these things in this book. Christian patted the book for emphasis. The fact is, if we are truly willing to have it, he will give to us freely. Pliable's face brightened. Well, my good companion, I'm glad to hear of all these things. Come on, let's pick up our pace. Christian let out a long sigh. I cannot go any faster because of this burden on my back. Now in my dream, as the two of them ended this talk, they drew near to a very muddy bog in the midst of the plain, but they didn't see it. In quick order, they both fell into the mire. The name of the marshy slough was Despond. Here they wallowed for a time until they were totally covered with the slime and mud. Because of the burden on his back, Christian began to sink. Pliable asked, Ah, neighbor Christian, where are you now? Truthfully, I don't know. Pliable felt offended and his face grew red. Is this the happiness you told me about? If we are stuck in the likes of this dirty goo right at the start, what can we expect between this? He said as he lifted his arms and let them slap the mud and our journey's end. If I get out of this mess with my life, You'll be going on alone to possess the brave country, for I will return home. With this, he struggled desperately and finally climbed out of the mire on the side of the bog nearest to his house. Once out, he didn't even turn to help Christian. In fact, he didn't even say goodbye. Instead, he walked away covered in filth and headed straight toward his house. Christian never saw him again so he was left to tumble in the slough of despond alone. But Christian struggled through the muck little by little toward the side of the bog farthest from his house, the side next to the wicket gate. He finally reached that side, but he couldn't get out because of the burden he carried on his back. But in my dream, a man came to help, a man came to him whose name was Help. What are you doing here, Help asked Christian. Sir, I was encouraged to go this way by a man called Evangelist. Christian pointed a muddy finger toward the wicket gate. He directed me to that gate over there, so I might escape the wrath to come. And as I headed toward it, I fell in here. He flicked mud from his fingertips into the mire. But why didn't you look for the steps? Help asked. We were talking, and I never thought to look for stairs. Help reached out toward Christian, then give me your hand. Christian reached out and grabbed his hand and Help pulled him out of the mucky mire and set him upon solid ground. Now, go on your way. In my dream, I stepped toward the man who plucked Christian out of the slough and asked, Sir, why isn't this hazard fixed so poor travelers can cross it safely since it is on the way from the city of destruction to the gate over there. This miry slough is a place that can't be repaired. It is a low-lying place where the scum and filth that come with the conviction of sin drain and collect as the traveling sinner becomes aware of his lost condition. It is the fears, doubts, and discouraging apprehensions about oneself that arise in his soul. The king is not happy that this place remains so bad. Based on the direction offered by his majesty's surveyors, his workers have also tended to this patch of ground for more than 2,000 years to see if it could possibly be fixed. Sadness filled Help's eyes. To my knowledge, at least 20,000 cartloads have been swallowed up by this mire. Cartloads of millions of wholesome instructions have been delivered at all seasons from all around the king's dominions. It is said these instructions are made of the best materials in order to create good, solid ground in this place if it could be fixed. But this is the slew of despond, and it will remain so even after they have done all they can. By the direction of the lawgiver, there are certain good and substantial steps placed through the very midst of this bog to offer a sure way. 
but this place spews out so much filth and changes with the weather, so that these steps are hardly seen. And often when men find the steps, they grow dizzy from their own guilt, and their feet miss the steps, and they become covered and stained with mud. But the steps are there, and the ground is good once they get in at the gate. Now in my dream, by this time, Pliable had arrived home to his house, and his neighbors came to visit him. Some of them called him a wise man for coming back, and some called him a fool for endangering his life by going with Christian in the first place. Others just made fun of him and mocked him for his cowardliness. They said, If I had started this adventure like you did, I wouldn't have been so timid as to quit after just a few difficulties. Pliable sat cringing among them at these words, but after a little time passed, he gained some confidence. When his neighbors saw his regained confidence, they turned against poor Christian instead and ridiculed him behind his back. However, even though they were no longer talking about him, their words against Christian concerned Pliable. Now as Christian walked alone, he spotted a man in the distance crossing the field to meet him. Eventually their paths met, and the gentleman introduced himself as Mr. Worldly Wise Man. He lived in the town of Carnal Policy, which was a large town close to Christian's hometown. Worldly Wise Man acted as if he had foreknowledge of Christians leaving the city of destruction, as if the leaving of destruction was a topic of much gossip, not only in the town where he lived, but also in other places where the news seemed to have spread. Because worldly wise men had an inkling of his coming, he had spotted Christian's arduous approach. When worldly wise men observed Christian's sighs and groans and the like, he engaged him in sympathetic conversation. Greetings, good fellow. Why are you traveling burdened in this manner? Burden manner, indeed. I think it's as large a burden as any poor creature ever had to carry, Christian said. And where am I going, you ask? Let me tell you, sir. I'm on my way to that distant wicket gate. Christian nodded in the direction of his goal. For there, I've been told, I will gain entrance to the place that will rid me of my heavy burden. Do you have a wife and children? Worldly wise men asked. Christian nodded, yes, yes I do. But I am so weighed down by this cumbersome burden that I can no longer enjoy their company like I used to. In fact, it makes me feel more like I don't even have a family. Worldly wise men studied Christian for a moment. Will you listen to me if I give you advice? Christian considered his answer. If it's good advice, I will, because truthfully, I'm in need of some wise advice. Worldly wise men said, Then I would advise you to get rid of that burden as fast as you can, because as long as you have it, you'll never have peace of mind or be able to enjoy the blessings God has bestowed on you. That's exactly what I want to do, to be rid of this heavy burden. But I can't get rid of it on my own, and I don't know of any man in our country who can take it off my shoulders. So I'm headed in this direction, as I told you, for that very purpose, to get rid of my burden. So who told you to go this way to get rid of your burden? Worldly wise men asked. A man who to me appeared to be a very great and honorable person. As I remember it, his name is Evangelist. Worldly wise men's face puckered into a sour expression. I most certainly condemn this man for his advice, there isn't a more dangerous and troublesome way in the world to travel than the way he has told you to go. You'll certainly learn this the hard way if you listen to his advice. In fact, by the looks of things, I'd say you've already experienced some of this difficulty. Isn't that the dirt and grime of the slough of despond I see on you? What you don't realize is that the slough is just the beginning of the sorrows you'll experience if you listen to that man, other pilgrims who have gone that way could very well tell you the truth of that experience. Listen to me. I am older and more experienced than you. If you continue in this direction, you are likely to experience wearisomeness, painfulness, 
hunger, perils, nakedness, swords, lions, dragons, darkness, and in a word, death, and who knows what else. Worldly wise men looked Christian directly in the eye and said, These things are certainly true and have been confirmed by the testimonies of many pilgrims just like yourself. So why should a man so carelessly place himself in danger by listening to a stranger like this man, Evangelist? You don't understand, sir, Christian replied. This burden on my back is more terrible to me than are all the things you have mentioned. He shook his head. No, I've given this thought, and I don't care what perils I meet along the way, as long as eventually I can be delivered from my burden. The older man asked, How did you come by your burden in the first place? Christian raised the book in his hand. By reading this book. Worldly wise men's lips thinned with disgust. I thought so. The same thing has happened to you as to other weak men who meddle with things too high for them. They are suddenly distracted and confused, just like you. And it's humiliating. I can see the same thing has happened to you. And the problem is they turn to desperate measures to obtain what they know very little about. Oh no, Christian replied. I know what I would obtain. I'd receive relief from my heavy burden. But why do you seek relief this way? By putting yourself in the path of so many dangers to get it. If you had enough patience to listen to me, I could tell you how to find what you're looking for without all the risk you'll run into along the way you're choosing to go. You see, the remedy I'm suggesting is nearby, and instead of dangers, it offers safety, friendship, and contentment. Christian eagerly looked at worldly wise men. Please, sir, tell me this secret. Why, the answer lies just a short distance away in the village named Morality. There ask after a gentleman by the name of Legality. He's a very judicious man, and a man of a very good name. He has skill to help men off with such burdens as yours from their shoulders. In fact, according to what I know, he has helped many pilgrims a great deal in this way. Besides that, he has the skill to cure those who are somewhat overwrought and irrational about their burdens. You can go to him and be helped right away. His house isn't quite a mile from here. And if he isn't home himself, he has a son who is friendly and easy to get along with, whose name is Civility. He can assist you in the same way as his father. You can be relieved of your burden there. A broad smile softened his features. If you decide not to go back to your former home, which I would recommend, you can send for your wife and children to come here to this village. Here we have suitable houses just waiting for someone to move into them, and they are reasonably priced. The living standards here are good, though a little expensive, but high quality. We have everything you need for a happy life. Plus, along with an environment, you can enjoy. You would be in the company of honest neighbors who are financially secure and live a good life. Christian was torn as what to do, but decided if what worldly wisdom said was true, then his advice was the wisest to take. Sir, he said, how do I find my way to this honest man's house? Mr. Worldly Wiseman pointed toward a steep, nearby hill. Do you see that high hill over there? Christian nodded. Yes, clearly. The older man said, You must walk up that hill, and the first house you come to is his. So Christian turned from his current path to go visit Mr. Legality's house for help. But as he approached the hill, it seemed to be steeper than he first thought. It rose so high that the sight of it hung above him. It raised fear in him to venture further, for he was afraid the hill could fall on his head. He stood there trying to figure out what to do, and his burden seemed heavier than ever, much heavier than when he had set out from his home. The sight filled Christian with dread that he would be burnt. Sweat beaded across his brow as, as he trembled with fear. He began to be sorry that he had taken worldly wise men's advice 
And just then he spotted evangelist coming to meet him. While he was relieved to see the man, at the same time, the blush of embarrassment heated his face, for he had ignored the man's advice. As evangelist drew near, Christian could see the man was annoyed and ready for a serious talk. What are you doing here, Christian? he asked. Christian didn't know what to say, so he just stood there without saying a word. Evangelist took in a deep breath and let it out slowly. Aren't you the man I found crying outside the walls of the city of destruction? Christian looked at his feet and nodded. Yes, I am the man. Didn't I give you directions to the little wicked gate? Yes, you did, dear sir. Then how is it you turned aside so quickly? You're going the wrong way. Christian shuffled his feet. Soon after I left the slough of despond, I met a gentleman. He seemed like he cared about me and persuaded me I could find a man in the village who could remove my burden. What did he look like? He looked like a gentleman, Christian said with a shrug. He dressed like one and talked like one. I didn't want to go to the village, but with all his fine words, this gentleman eventually talked me into following his advice. So I came here, but as I drew close to this hill and saw how it hangs over the way, I stopped. I was afraid it could fall on my head. Exactly what did the gentleman say to you? Well, he asked me where I was going, and so I told him. What then, evangelist asked? What did he say next? He asked me if I had a family. I told him I did. But I explained how this burden on my back weighs me down so much that I can't take pleasure in them like I used to. And what did he say after that? He told me to get rid of my burden quickly. I explained that was what I was trying to do, that I sought relief. I described how I was traveling to the gate ahead so I could learn how to get directions to reach the place of deliverance. He said he would show me a better way that was closer and not fraught with all the dangers and difficulties as the way you set me in. He told me how to get to another man's house, one who knows how to take off burdens like mine. Christian looked away. So I believed him and turned from the way you had advised me to go in hopes I might soon be relieved of my burden. But when I came to this place, he pointed toward the looming hill and saw things as they are. I stopped dead in my tracks with fear and didn't know what to do. Just stand still for a little while, the evangelist said, so I can show you the words of God. So Christian stood trembling as he listened to what evangelist had to say. Make sure you don't refuse him who speaks to you, Christian, for if Israel did not escape judgment when they didn't listen to him, how much more will we not escape if we turn away from him when he speaks to us from heaven? And besides that, he tells us that the righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Then evangelist pointed at Christian, you are the man who is running into this misery. You have begun to reject the direction offered by the Most High and to draw back from the way of peace. In fact, you are teetering at the point of being in danger of eternal punishment and damnation. Christian fell down at his feet as dead and cried, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Evangelist caught him by the right hand and said, Men will be forgiven their sins and blasphemies. Don't be faithless but believe. Christian revived a little and stood up trembling again before evangelist who said, pay careful attention to the things I am going to tell you. I'm going to show you who it was that deluded you and who it was he sent you to. The man who met you is one worldly wise man, and rightly he is called by this name, partly because he has an appetite only for the doctrine of this world. This is why he always goes to the town of morality to church, because he loves the doctrine taught there, because he thinks it saves him best from the cross. Because he is of this carnal temperament, he seeks to oppose my ways, even though I am doing the work of an evangelist. Now there are three things in this man's counsel that you must utterly detest. First is his ability to turn you from the way you should go and get you sidetracked. 
The second is the way he works to portray the cross as odious to you. And lastly, that he points you in the direction which leads to death. You must despise his ability to turn you from the way, and yes, even the fact that you consented to his proposal. To do so is to reject the counsel of God in favor of the counsel of a worldly wise man. The Lord says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. This wicked man has turned you away from this little wicked gate and from the way that leads to it. He has almost brought you to destruction. For this reason, you must hate his ability to turn you from the way, and in the same way, you should loathe yourself because you listen to him. Secondly, you must detest his zeal to make the cross as offensive to you, for you are to prefer it more than the treasures of Egypt. Besides, the King of Glory has told you that the one who saves his life shall lose it. Consider that worldly wise men has worked diligently to persuade you to believe that the king's advice will lead to your death, while the truth says you can't have eternal life without following the king's advice. As a result, you must abhor this doctrine circulated by worldly wise men. Thirdly, you must hate the fact that he told you to follow the way that leads to death. In the same way, you must consider the one he sent you to and how he is unable to deliver you from your burden. You see, while it was promised that legality could make the job of removing your burden easier, the fact is that he is the son of the bondwoman who is in bondage along with her children. You see, she represents Mount Sinai. Evangelist gestured with an open hand toward the overhanging mountain. The very thing you feared would fall on your head. Now, if she and her children are in bondage, how can you expect to be made free by them? This legality isn't able to set you free from your burden. No matter what worldly wise men told you, the fact is that no one has ever been rid of his burden by him, nor is he likely to be able to do so in the future. Evangelist spoke from his heart with great passion. You cannot be justified by the works of the law because it isn't how one follows the law or the good things they do that rids one of their burden. This makes worldly wise men nothing more than an illegal guide and Mr. Legality a cheat. As for Legality's son, Civility, he's full of hot air. With his smirking facade, he is nothing but a hypocrite. Evangelist shook his head. He can't help you. Believe me, there is nothing in what he says. You've heard of these intoxicated men who dream up ways to deprive you of your salvation by turning you from the way in which I had set your path. After this, Evangelist called aloud to the heavens for confirmation of what he had said. In reply, I heard a voice and witness fire spewing from the mountain under which poor Christian stood. It made the hair on his flesh stand up. The voice cried out, Those who trust in the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Christian thought he was going to die and began to cry out with an agonizing wail. He even cursed the time he met with worldly wise men and called himself a fool a thousand times over for listening to that man's advice. Shame filled him. To think that this gentleman's arguments were nothing more than fleshly advice and yet caused him to forsake the right way. He scolded himself for being so foolish and came to his senses. He paid attention once again to what Evangelist said and had the sense to follow his guidance. Christian looked to Evangelist and asked, Sir, what do you think? Is there any hope? May I now go back to the way that leads to the wicket gate? Or will I be abandoned for what I've done and sent back to where I came from riddled with shame. I am sorry I ever listened to this man's counsel. May my sin be forgiven? Evangelist looked at him with a serious expression. Your sin is very great. 
For you have committed two evils. You abandoned the way that is good, and you chose to walk in forbidden paths. Yet the man at the gate will receive you, for he has good will for men. But be careful not to turn aside again, because if you do, you may perish altogether when his wrath is ignited. The end of the first stage. Next time, stage two. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.